Friends, let us bow our heads in prayer. Loving God, we are aware of the presence of the Spirit, the walk with Christ, and the opportunity that you have to hold us and to lead us in these times in which we live. Allow us during this hour together to be calmed and connected and guided by that Spirit. In Christ we pray. Amen. How are you? Good to see you. join me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. For we know that the Lord is great. The Lord does great things in heaven and on earth, in the seas and the sky and the land. God's name endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let us worship God.
we gather in this holy place that we might know and understand God better. Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship at Bradley Hills. Whether we're here in the sanctuary or across the country or world online, we are we're grateful for the opportunity to, to connect and to worship God together. If you're new to our community, we're so glad on this beautiful day that you are here. We have some welcome visitor packets in our narthex, and, and following worship today, I'm going to be gathering in the library today. Uh, we, ha- we have a one o'clock funeral in Covenant Hall for Lori Koch and Ruther. Uh, I'll be gathering with folks following worship today who'd like to get more connected or or learn about the ministries of our church, or even explore membership. And so 1145 in the library. And for those online as well, uh, there's a link in the bulletin for you to join us on the Zoom. And if someone would like to connect during the week, chance to talk about the church or get connected or pray together, my email is david at bradleyhillschurch.org. You will see announcements in the life of our community online. The bulletin is there. The Give Now icon is there. The children's bulletins are there. But you'll see announcements in the life of our busy community this time of year. We're going to continue our 8.30 services outside if we can, if weather permits, for a few more weeks. But then they'll move uh, inside as it was this morning uh, for the winter. And adult education happens at 9.15 between our two worship services. Following worship today, Smart Sacks helps put food together for those in need in the lounge. That's after worship today. We have a great new children's choir opportunity at 1145 in the choir room today, the Cherub Choir. And we have a communion, understanding communion class next week and our Bradley Hills Presents concert at 5 o'clock on the 22nd. And many other activities in the life of our church that you'll see if you explore your bulletin. And for families with kids, our always beloved Trunk or Treat, October 28th at 530 as we gather outside on October 20. Eighth, lots of costumes and food and fun. As you know, it's, it is a season of stewardship. I'd like to invite Rosanna Howard to come forward if, if she would. And it's a time when we've been hearing folks share a thought or two in worship during this season of stewardship. And we're grateful that Rosanna is here today to share a word with us. Rosanna? Good morning. Um, I'm Rosanna Howard. And um, for those of you who don't know our family, my husband, Andrew, and our children, and we have two boys, James and Jonathan, who are five and six. Um, We joined the church less than a year ago, Um, and we started attending shortly after VBS, not this past summer, but the previous summer, and I got an email, and it asked me, as a new church member, what had made me join the church. Um, And I started reflecting on it, and uh, I can tell you what drew us in, Um, and that is our newly ordained um, uh, children's minister, Matt Nabinger. Um, I came uh, to watch our boys um, and pick them up for vacation Bible school, and I watched Matt um, uh, dancing with the children. Um, He was voguing, for those of you who don't know, it's it's this kind of dance. Um, And he was having so much fun, and he was so holy himself, and the children were so engaged, and I thought, I think, I think we might have found our place. Um, and what solidified that for us is we're a military family, um, and for that, for what that means is that we move every two to three years. And I grew up in the church. My parents were both um, deacons in the church. Um, they were part of the leadership and the ministry of the church, and that was always very important to me. Um, but as someone who moves around a lot, that's difficult. Um, it's difficult to get established in a church for any length of time and, and see that lead to roles in lay ministry. And that wasn't the case here. Um, I came in um, and my opinions were welcomed. Um, before I was even a member, um, at my input, my gifts were sought after, and there was immediately a place for me at Bradley Hills Presbyterian to share my gifts. Um, and I didn't feel like I needed to wait till every member sitting in the pews knew my name. 
um, or, uh, or even until my membership had, had, had gone through. I think we were um, part of a membership class in October, but didn't end up joining until December. And, um, but before that even happened, um, the ministry here and the folks at this church said, you are welcome. We want to use your t gifts and talents, and there is a place for you to lead and to minister at Bradley Hills. And that is so powerful. Um, and I, uh, I find myself serving on the Children's Ministry Committee. Um, I am the one who talks the most in our Zoom meetings. I have lots of ideas. Um, and, and that kind of comes with the territory of having moved around and been in a lot of churches. I've seen, I've seen what works in churches. I've seen what doesn't work. I've seen where churches can grow. I have a background in education. And, and, um, and at no point was my voice silenced. It was welcomed. It was embraced. Um, and... Um, you all put me right to work, and, um, and that's exactly what I needed, because um, in allowing me to have a space in lay ministry and to give my gifts and talents to this church in a very meaningful way, you ministered to me, um, and you filled a hole in my heart um, that had been there for a while, um, because we moved around and because it took me a while to get established and it because there wasn't always room for new voices and some of the churches we attended and it's such a beautiful thing to to find that here um, and um, in fact it's it's one of the reasons I've told my husband I don't want to leave the DMV um, if you could make the army let us stay here that'd be great um, but unfortunately, that's not always how it works. Um, so you're welcome, everyone. I've started a bunch of brand new projects, and then I'm going to leave them all in your hands. Um, no, <laughs> um, no but, but I also know, because our goal is ultimately to come back here and settle our family here when, when the military thinks it's time, um, I know that there's a place waiting for me here at Bradley Hills. Um, and I am just so grateful, um, but because for me, um, stewardship, you know, looks like being able to give my gifts and talents and being able to see them utilized in ministry. Um, and I used to think that that meant I had to go get an MDiv and um, become a minister, and that wasn't the path that I was called down. And so to find myself being able to be active in ministry here in this church as a lay person, as a new member, um, as a military family, I think is the greatest um, gift that you all could have given me. Um, and I thank you for letting me continue to give my gifts. Um, and a short, quick children's ministry plug, I am leading the new choir that is starting this afternoon um, for our youngest um, uh, congregants. And so we hope to see you all um, at the Cherub Choir practice from 1145 to 1215. If you're a new member, um, the beauty of that is um, you can drop your kids with me and then you can go have some coffee and fellowship and meet some other folks. Um, and then also, um, you know, we've got Trunk or Treat, and we have all these wonderful children's and families um, mi ministry um, events and programs happening um, that I am so fortunate to um, be a part of. So um, I give a heartfelt thank you to you, the members of Bradley Hills, to you, the ministry of Bradley Hills, uh, the ministers of Bradley Hills, um, for giving me a place um, and welcoming me into the ministry of this church. So, thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. Friends, would you please join me in the prayer of adoration and confession, which is found in your bulletin, followed by a time of silence for your own personal prayers. O Holy One, we again gather to get more clarity on how to be in relationship with you. Help us learn to be more true to you today. We declare that we are the wrong age or not strong enough, and we do not do your will. 
We do not share your love with the lonely and those wandering. We fail at times to ears to hear, hearts to love, and hands to do your will. Help us, forgive us, rescue us from ourselves, such that we may live fully in you. seated. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, children. It's so great to see you. You know, there's a Bible passage that I have been thinking about recently. It's from the New Testament, from the book of Philippians. Can you say Philippians? Philippians. It's from Philippians chapter 2, and the person who wrote Philippians chapter 2 was a man called Paul. Paul was a really important teacher and leader in the church. And Paul says in Philippians 2 that all of us, we Christians, should learn to think about ourselves the way Jesus thought about himself. Jesus had equal status with God. And even though Jesus was equal with God, he did not think too highly of himself. He was not arrogant. He put aside privileges. He put aside big, important titles. And instead of becoming a king or a really famous person, he took the status of a servant. Jesus was equal with God, but instead of being bossy, telling everyone what to do, or making everybody worship him, he served people. He washed people's dirty feet. He came close to people that nobody else wanted to come close to. Um, And when he came close to them, amazing things happened. People could see things they'd never seen before. They could do things they'd never done before. Because Jesus was humble enough to come close to people. And Paul says that this is how we should think about ourselves As Christians, do you know what the word Christian means? The word Christian means little Christ. So a Christian is someone who acts like Jesus Christ. We are all Christians here, and we are all called to act like Jesus Christ. How did he act? Well, he gave up his power. He didn't try to control other people. He didn't boss people around. Instead, he was humble. 
and he served others, he helped others. I wonder how we can act like Jesus Christ today. I wonder what God is calling you to do today to be humble like Jesus. Let's pray. Ready? You're going to repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the example of Jesus who came to serve people. Help us to be humble like he was and put others before ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well now you may go in peace. scripture lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verses 1 through 16. Friends, hear these words. An unfriendly person pursues selfish ends and against all sound judgment starts quarrels. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. When wickedness comes, so does contempt and with shame comes reproach. The words of the mouth are deep waters, but the fountain of wisdom is a rushing stream. It is not good to be partial to the wicked and so deprive the innocent of justice. The lips of fools bring them strife and their mouths invite a beating. The mouths of fools, fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very lives. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower the righteous run to it and are safe. But the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it is a wall too high to scale. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Hmm. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. The human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? The heart of the discerning acquires knowledge, for the ears of the wise seek it out. A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
Will you please pray with me? Loving God, as we gather today, may we too have the humility of, of Mary, whose magnificat so beautifully expressed, might lead us as we seek to emulate our Lord and find wisdom for our living. In Christ we pray. Amen. As we continue in our series of messages on wisdom from the book of Proverbs, those bite-sized phrases from the Hebrew Bible that help lead to better decision-making, the second part, the middle section of Proverbs, is meant to share wisdom for folks universally, for those entering a household, and in particular, perhaps, for someone who might eventually be in government. Scholars believe it's targeted towards a youth being instructed around bar mitzvah or confirmation age, for example. And today, our lesson that Denise read focuses on humility. A young person hearing lessons who, like Mary, would find value and meaning and wholeness in it. We know from our culture the phrase, pride comes before the fall. That is proverbial. It's part Genesis 3, but also part Proverbs 18 and part chapter 16. Humility is key to the whole book of Proverbs. As we mentioned, that key verse from 1-7, our second lesson for today, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, encourages us to respect God. Now, no one wants to come in second, I know from running a bit as a lad that I wanted to be the anchor on our relay team at the time in school, but I wasn't fast enough. So they made me run in the second position. The slowest of the four on a four by 100 relay team sometimes had to go second. I didn't want to do that. But humility requires patience and choices. During the 2020 Olympics, US gymnastics team came in second in the team competition. In part, some say, because the great American gymnast Simone Biles withdrew during the competition after doing well in the women's all-around at first, citing a need for healing. She chose to step back, and Russia won the gold in the all-around, and the U.S. came in second. Biles endured much unfair criticism for taking time to heal. But choosing humility allows, even requires us, at times to ultimately put our trust in God. It allows us to run a righteous race in life, as the writer of Proverbs would say, when we reflect on what we say, how we think, and what we do. The first part of our lesson today focuses on what we say. It focuses on speaking and listening. Verses four through eight are mostly about the value and challenge of speech, the good and the harm that can come from what we say and do. Proverbs suggest that the tongue can do harm, and so we should be humble in what we say. Our passage lifts up the corollary, of course, which is the value of listening. We know with our deep divisions in Congress and overall that the ability to listen deeply is increasingly important. For as another wise proverb puts it, we can learn more from listening than from talking. Being humble in communication means seeking to hear and to understand. The second part of our lesson from verses 9 through 14 shows a contrast between the physical and the spiritual world. Verse 14 says that in a world that we live in, we can find ourselves with, quote, a crushed spirit. And a crushed spirit is with and where many of us find ourselves today. The violence in the Holy Land overwhelms us with agony. It is looking like a situation where no one will come in first. No winners, only great losses. And so with all that is going on, how do we as Christians 
be called to reflect on it. I had originally planned to focus more today on the role of secondary actors in biblical dramas. Those points can wait till later in the fall. I want to focus a little bit more on how our scripture from Proverbs might help us focus on a time such as this instead. For me, I think about the paradox that our scripture brings forward today. First, that contrast between the spiritual and the physical. So, for example, the same Hebrew word is used in verses 10 and 11. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. But the wealth of the rich in their fortified city, they imagine it is a wall too high to scale. But before a downfall, the heart is haughty. In the NIV, that word there, the same one, is rendered as fortified, and there is a contrast between the downfall of putting faith in material things and the only true safety long-term, which is the focus on God. That is central to the entirety of wisdom literature, by the way. It's central to Ecclesiastes as well. The writer says that there are times when we feel that what we have physically fortifies or protects us creates a physical barrier, a wall too high to scale, but that overconfidence is our downfall. That it was writing at a particular time in Israel's history. An article after article this week, op-ed sections of the New York Times on Wednesday and the Washington Post on Thursday talked about the assumption that physical barriers would again protect Israel. And now there is nothing but shock. The writer of Proverbs concludes that it is only the spiritual that lasts forever. And so how do we process it all? As we gather today, we feel many emotions, shock and anger, outrage and concern, confusion, anxiety, depression. Our hearts are broken too. And we hold in our minds contrasting and complex concerns legitimate paradoxes. Hamas has killed 1,300 people in an incredibly brutal attack, including massacring children. The images are horrific, and we are reeling from the brutality. Hamas took close to 150 hostages, including women, children, and the elderly. The problem of evil is real in our world. And we stand with BJC in opposing anti-Semitism, in affirming Israel's right to exist and be safe and secure and strong. Legitimate defense matters even with all the concerns many of us have about the current Israeli leadership and settlements. And yet, the unfolding situation in Gaza with more than 2,000 Palestinians dead, hundreds of thousands displaced, and the UN urging that what now is a threatening humanitarian crisis as families flee the land. Palestinian hopes for self-determination and a homeland in a two-state solution are important. The hearts of our friends with MIC Mosque here are heartbroken as well. For Hamas does not represent them or the Muslim world. And so a couple of you have reached out this week saying you just don't know what to say about the situation. It's, it's all so terrible and complex. We know from our scripture today how words can do damage is one thing that our early verses of this proverb lead us to conclude. It's hard to know what to say. As one of you put it, anything I say can be attacked by someone. I can't speak too loudly to either criticize or support the current Israeli government or risk being criticized. Any social media post, another one of you said, someone else will say, well, why didn't you post it in this particular way? Harvard students having their name posted online for criticizing Israel, people being canceled, a Washington Post article this very morning about how people are struggling from Stanford to Microsoft to Starbucks to our own county school system on how to express their feelings. To me, the challenge is that there are no words to adequately adequately express the pain many feel, or even our own emotions. And so we are in humility trying to figure out what to say. 
And there are real nuances here. But there are also real absolutes at stake, too. And it takes wisdom, the wisdom of the writer of Proverbs, perhaps, the wisdom of God to discern the difference. Now, while words can harm, they also can help. And so we should say words of honest emotion and hurt and support in humility. Because part of humility is to realize that we aren't always going to get the words perfect. And it is okay to feel the paradox. But as Christians, we are called first and foremost to care about people. Compassion matters. We are always called to be concerned about people and innocence even far away. Harming civilians should not be normalized. For each person on each side of a conflict such as this is a human being. With a family or people who love them, Each person on each side of a conflict, with all their flaws, are children of God in the end, made in God's image. And not just far away, we are called to care about people nearby. I attended parts of two worship services on Friday. At 1.30, I was with our mosque partners, and Friday night, I was worshiping with BJC, our partner synagogue, both in the same room. At 1.30 MIC meets in Covenant Hall, 7.30 BJC meets there. The Torah portion on Friday night, by the way, at BJC was that tohu vavohu portion of Genesis that some of you taught the kids at VBS this year. And I listened to imams and rabbis talk in the very same room on Friday, hours apart, about the Holy Land events, and there were great similarities in their messages. People are people. I talked as well on Friday with MIC members who have relatives in Gaza. I've sat with several BJC members this week whose cousins have been called up for military service, who had friends at the music festival where the massacre took place, one BJC member whose cousin was killed in southern Israel, our friend Josh who spoke in Memorial Hall a few years ago's cousin is a hostage in Gaza. Our friends are hurting nearby and our words and actions matter. And at the end of the day, as Christians, we are called to stand for peace. For what would Jesus do? As those who follow the Prince of Peace, we are called to seek it. And yet, how do we work for peace from where we are in these times? I'm searching for answers alongside you. We have mission partners on the ground. We have interfaith partners near and far. But I don't have all the answers. But I do know, as the writer of Proverbs did, that we worship a God described in both the Old and New Testaments as one who grieves along with us. As I wrote to you this week, in my office to the left of my computer is a nine-pronged candle holder in the shape of a a menorah, a, a Jewish symbol that recalls a military victory to some, but to others notes the transforming power of light. To the right of my desk is the painting of an owl, the symbol of wisdom, given to me by the artist, a young Palestinian woman from Gaza who spoke here a few summers ago. In the middle of my wall in my office is a cross resting between the other two symbols. As we grieve, we pray that we here and those in Israel and Palestine and our sisters and brothers around the world may be gifted with wise decision-making about resources and restraint, security and compassion, and that we can all live to see a day when swords will be transformed into plowshares by the grace of the light, and that we who follow the Prince of Peace can do our part, however small, to pray and work for peace near and far. For the writer of Proverbs would say, don't put your trust in the things of the world. In humility, be careful about speech, but committed to working for peace and faith. And when the writer of Proverbs says that we are to turn to God for all safety, he doesn't mean, if you were here today, that greater faith would have saved civilians in Israel or elsewhere. But it does mean when we gather with a crushed spirit, we can turn to God. 
Calling on the name of the Lord means trusting God with what our city walls and mortal bodies cannot indeed secure. An eternal self-keeping of our souls, come what may. For on our own, these situations that we face can seem unbearable. But with God and faith and community, maybe our spirit can find a little hope. Finally, verse 12 tells us that before a downfall, the heart is haughty. All humility comes before honor. We know from Genesis 3 and the metaphor of the fall that pride comes before it. What would Jesus have said in those times? What does Jesus say in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, his seminal teaching? Some have argued, by the way, that God loves odd numbers. That's another interesting mathematical discussion, but what do our first four odd-numbered Beatitudes tell us? Jesus said in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To be poor in spirit means the same thing as Proverbs 1-7, that we should fear and respect the Lord in humility. Verse 5, Jesus says, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. To be meek doesn't mean weak, it means to be humble. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. May all on all sides of conflict remember that. Or as Paul might have put it, we are sinners saved by grace, each of us. And verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. With so much focus on winning and losing and not coming in second, you know, there are times when humility pays off. For example, if you look at the baseball playoffs this year, there are arguments that the teams that did not win their division are doing better than the teams that came in first. There's some that argue that baseball is a repetitive game and therefore those teams that won their division and had too much time off have not fared as well as the teams that didn't win the division came in second and had to keep playing because it's a repetitive game. That the rhythm matters and too much rest isn't good. For others, rest is good. Simone Biles, after finishing second in 2020 at the Olympics in our team, took some time off and just a few weeks ago led the U.S. team to a gold medal in the World Championships. She got a second chance. Someone who grew up in and out of foster care systems went on to become the oldest gymnast to win the U.S. championships and the youngest American to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In our our hymn that we are just about to sing in just a moment is one where coming in second isn't all bad either. Written by choir director Doris Akers, In 1962, she was a choir director getting ready for her choir to go in to sing and worship. And as she always did, she started to pray with them. And she kept praying and praying. And the service was about to start. She told the pastor, sent word that we're still praying. The choir's not ready to go in yet. And after a while, the service was beginning, and she had to bring the choir into worship. She told the choir, I quote, I hate to leave this room because there is such a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And a new song was partially born. Aker said she wanted so badly to get out a piano and a pen and to write down that song, but she had to work. She had to go into the worship service. And after the service ended, she thought she'd lost the song. She returned home and hadn't, hadn't written down a word. But the next morning, Akers got a second chance. The song reappeared in her head, and she went to a piano and wrote the hymn, There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And that's what I feel with you all. That this is a safe space in a challenging world, a special place, such a sweet Not because you or I are perfect, but because the spirit of a loving God and of Jesus walks alongside us. And in the times we live in, we need that more than ever. which we run, let us live with humility. As what we say matters, let us watch what we say and be willing to listen. As what we think matters, it's okay to hold the paradoxes. 
Because what we do matters, let us pray and work for peace. And in all things, be willing to follow the one who humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, stay with us. Fill us with your love. And for your blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Amen. be seated. I invite Andrew Milne to come forward here, our chair of our personnel lay ministry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I have the happy opportunity not to talk about coming in second place because everyone we're here to recognize this morning, I believe if you've worked with any of them, they're first place in our hearts. We're here to honor four members of our staff for significant service anniversaries today, uh, beginning with Marie Marquis, who is our soprano section leader and has been serving in that role for five years, and also for a little less than that, 
has been working as the leader of our children's choir as well. Marie, thank you every, very much for everything we do. Uh, for everyone today, we have a bouquet and also so much, words Marie. of thanks thank and a you. gift card for their service with us. I don't today. know. I don't know. Thank you, Marie. I guess so. I guess so. Do you want to stay or go? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. stay? Okay. okay. Our, our second honoree today is Matthew Robertson, also from our music department. Matthew has led our music department now for 10 years, serving as director of music ministries, doing wonderful things not only with our choir on Sundays, leading a group of talented section leaders, but also leading our Friends of Music program, various concerts, and keeping the musical life of this church active, interesting, and creative and lively. Matthew, thank you very much. And we look forward to more creative and, and uh, musical experience as, as we work together. Our next awardee is not here with us today. Uh, we have two members. We have two members from our music group, and we have two members from our facility staff. Leo Bruno, one of our sextons, has now been with us for 20 years. Uh, Leo doesn't work on Sundays, so he's not here with us today. Uh, but we do also have a card and a gift card, which we will be sharing with him uh, when he's here next week. And finally, somewhere out here, Farid Beltran is in the sanctuary. Farid. Let me, let, me, let me pray at the end. Maybe I pray at the end. Sure. Yeah, very end. Right, yeah. Farid has been with us now for 30 years. 30 years. And having... Thank you. Having been with the personal lay ministry on and off for about half that time, a little less, I know that Farid's responsibilities and contributions to the church have steadily grown over that time. Uh, he's helped us with our energy use. He's helped us with the cost of that energy use. He helps us with the security in the building. A lot of tasks that we just assume get done, but it's a lot of work to get them there. And also to manage our staff of Sextons as well. Farid, thank you very much for everything you do. Let's give thanks to God for the gifts that these four individuals represent. Loving God, we give you thanks for Marie and for Matthew, for Leo and Fareed. Deeply gifted by the Spirit through your love with gifts that we are so grateful that they have chosen by your grace to use and express through this congregation. May you watch over them and those that they love. May they continue to be blessed as they are such a blessing to us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Go in peace, friends. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Marie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe there's some cake after the service as well, which helps honor and we continue to give our thanks following worship. Our last scripture the last verse from our scripture lesson today is a gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. So we come to worship to seek the presence of the Lord and as the ushers come forward, we know that the gift of being able to give connects us deeply with God. Let us give thanks as we share now our morning offerings.
this time, we are um, in our service for uh, the opportunity to share our concerns and our celebrations. And so, is there anyone who would like to share them aloud or um, as we pray together later, then we know that you'll hold them in your hearts. But is there someone who has something special that they'd like to share? Either a concern or a joy, yes. So for uh, the Scroggs daughter who had surgery recently, um, prayers for her full recovery. So it's a concern as well as a joy that she will make a full recovery. So let's, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And with thanksgiving, we praise the Lord. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. And his name, Keith, yeah. For, for the family of Keith, um, who passed away suddenly just a couple of days ago, and for his uh, wife um, and all their children, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So sorry. If you would join me in prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you and we praise your holy name. Lord, you are our rock and our strength. Thank you for the blessing of waking us up this morning to just see another day. Morning by morning, we know that you give us new mercies. Creator God, you are the God, the source of all creation. And we call you Father and we are told that we are made in your image. That your essence, your love runs through all of our veins. Yet we forget that we are all siblings. We even forget that we are neighbors. We forget that there is enough for everyone to live a good life. Help us to love you more, love you better, so that we might also love our neighbors. This morning we pray for all the people in what we call the Holy Land. During this time of war, we pray for a lasting peace. We know that peace is hard work, we also know that we can't get there alone. So we pray that your love and your wisdom will guide us. Lord, help us to become of one mind in you. Lord, help us to be a help, to be an instrument of your peace in all that we say and all that we do. Lord, even as we pray for peace, we are aware of the reality that our world is filled with war and violence. And so we ask for your protection over people in all the places of this world filled with war. Protect hospitals, health care workers, and other helpers trying to keep people alive. We pray for families bearing their loved ones. We pray for the emotional and the psychological trauma that war leaves on people. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear their prayers. And we pray for those in our own community who are in need of your care. We think about the people on our bulletin and prayer list, on our prayer chain. And so we ask that you be with those who have lost loved ones, the family of Keith, of Steve Burns, who lost his cousin Andrew, of Lori's family, 
of Lois's family, of Ethan, who lost his grandmother. Lord, we also know that our bodies are frail, and so we know that we go through different stages of life where we need healing, and so we pray for Ira and Cindy, for Sharon and for Eric, for Melinda and Bob and for Kay and for Chuck, and for those who are carrying the weight of their suffering privately, we pray for them compassionate God in those places where there is heartache and fear, fear of the unknown. May your presence be a source of strength and comfort. Care for everyone and reveal your presence to everyone so that we will know that you are with us always. We also pray for those who are experiencing joy when we experience joy, Lord, we experience you. And we sing, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Everything that is good and perfect comes for you. So we are delighted to rejoice with those who are experiencing your joy in tangible ways at this time. We thank you for those who celebrate ordinations and personal accomplishments for church anniversaries, for weddings, for personal anniversaries. And even in grief, there's joy in celebrating, in community, and remembering the life of a loved one. We thank you for those who simply feel good right now. So we remember that those who are who are suffering, that they have space to be able to share others' joys, and those who have joys have space to suffer with those who suffer. And Lord, please help us to remember and to know that pink candle days are not reserved only for Advent, that we can experience your joy in so many things that you bless us with. We trust you, God, for you have been good to us, Yes, you have been so good. May we love each other with a sincere heart. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs>
May God guide you, keep you, and lead you on from hope to hope, from strength to strength, from grace to grace. And together, may the people of God say, Amen. And friends, let us share with each other a sign of peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And go in peace. Peace be with you.